and dad was lying on the ground and told me to go. I don't, I remember seeing my dad lying on the ground, but I don't remember much. The next memory I have is in the hospital. And at one point in time, he was told he might not ever walk again. You know, my, my peers will look at a book and say, you got that salary going there and say, whoa, 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 why? And like, you don't understand. There's opportunity right now in home improvements mm-hmm. that, that, that we've never seen before. And they're even talking about a downturn in the economy next year. It's still hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars going to be spent on home improvements that, that we all have an opportunity to share. We, we still have 250, 300 roofs that needs to be installed in the spring. Why we chose the Salesforce platform is, and why we decided to build one is because none of them did what we wanted them to do. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today I have very special guest, humbled to have him because uh, I personally looked up to him all these years as a business owner of Storm Group Roofing. And to be honest with you, he always been my competitor, but never felt like he was the one. He was more like an older brother that I never have. Anyway, welcome <laughs> to the studio, Andy Linus. Thank you so much for being here, brother. Uh, honor for me, Dimitri. You know that. I've uh, Your story is something I've adored since I, I first heard it. When when you and I first got to have that sit down, but it was just us and got a little emotional talking about the the stresses of business and 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 like I told you on, on a couple different occasions, I, I look at you I look up to you as much as like you always say nice things about me. I've always looked up to you as like this guy had a harder road than almost any person I know in the business. And as you see people at your conference, um, there's a lot of similarities between those people mm-hmm. and and my mom and dad. Meaning like I can name off the top of my head the five contractors that gave us most of the work in the 80s. Wow. Because I remember my parents having to talk about trying to collect from those five contractors. Those names came up over and over. Three of them aren't in business anymore. But 80% of our work at one point in time came from home builders because mm. we were the laborers. We did the siding and roofing for the, 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 the builders of Western Wisconsin and Eastern Minnesota. And that's where we got most of our work. And as you walk around your conference, here's a bunch of people that have been working for contractors. I met a lot of those people. And some of them, you know, they, 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 they've immigrated here or they've started this business up and they start with contractors. Now they're trying to figure out how can I take the next step? And I'm, I'm guessing they, they walked away from your conference with, the, with some ideas on how to do that. Cause boy, that was, I've been in business since, you know, I can remember my parents started in 79 and I walked away with pages of notes. Hey, I sat in on Clay's breakout and I learned from him and no one I've been with Rodney longer than anyone in the country and I like I'm texting my sales managers in in Clay's breakout going well we're doing that wrong <laughs> yeah so uh, it's uh your ability to learn is amazing let's start there let's start with your family your family started a company in 1979 you grew up in a family business how was it describe your parents raising you guys and running construction company in Wisconsin you know you know um dad was a farmer we had, we had pigs growing up. In fact, I still live in the same house that I grew up in, the pig farm. I have the original, which it's is my stability. mom's, which is the house that my mother grew up in. Wow. So I have an abstract that, that actually talks about a wagon trail. So that's how old the, the, this property goes back and, and, and every one of us have remodeled it. My uncle Bill remodeled it, my dad remodeled it, and I remodeled it. And um, pigs weren't paying the way. So dad started doing siding on the side and started making more money that way. But then uh, I think it was 1981, 82, somewhere in there. Uh, Dad was taking the top off a tree and fell, broke his back. I, uh, mom had sent me outside to see if dad wanted to come in for lunch or offer him a, a snack or, or something like that. And dad was lying on the ground and told me to go, I don't, I remember seeing my dad lying on the ground, but I don't remember much. The next memory I have is in the hospital. And at one point in time, he was told he might not ever walk again. And you still see this big scar on his back when, when he takes his shirt off. But a couple of things happened to us there. Our community stepped up. Like the community came and ran our pigs a lot. Wow. The, my uncles did help finish some of the side jobs. The local Lions Club ran a fundraiser and bought us a new stove for our house because we were, you know, that was our only income. And, and as dad started to get back into the swing of things, you know, the, the pigs, 
got to be more of a burden. So he ended up selling all of the pigs. Like my earliest memory is my father giving a, a piglet mouth to mouth after it being born. Wow. And, and, and cause that was, you know, that pig lives, that's going to be the difference of a profitable quarter or in the, on the farm. I, I actually have done it with yeah. my grand, uh, grandparents. We used to grow pigs too. A lot. Yeah. See, I'm telling you, there's, there's similarities between us here, Dimitri, that, <laughs> that the more get, we dig. Uh, back to construction, like how did he go from farming to construction? So as he sold the pigs, that gave him a little bit of capital to, to, to start doing construction and making those relationships as a cider mainly um, for, for builders. And then we got into the U.S. Seamless siding franchise. And you know, it wasn't always easy. I can, I can tell you this, my parents... I have the benefit of looking back at records that go back to, you know, 1979. And I can tell you the accountant in 1991 told them they could declare bankruptcy. Really? You know, it, you, you, you go all in with builders and some of them don't pay you. That can, that can be hard. Like you have all these bills that you have to pay or you have a couple of big customers that don't pay you. Mm-hmm. And you're, and you're starting out there like, we didn't have the, the bankroll and the savings. Did your dad do the work or you have employees? Or? Dad, dad sold and installed. So he was on a crew installing during the day mm-hmm. and at night running, running the opportunities. In fact, when I first started with the company, um, it was my dad and one other person were the only salespeople we had. And When did you start? What year? Uh, it would have been 1994. Mm-hmm. 1994 uh, is when we got into the LeafGuard franchise. And the reason why we got into LeafGuard franchise is dad took his one salesman and his two managers and said, I want you to read a trade magazine once a week and we're going to have a meeting and you have to come up with an idea. And one of the guys brought LeafGuard as an idea. And so, so you started with it as a siding installer franchise mm-hmm. and then LeafGuard. Why franchise? Why not build your own company? You know, uh, it was a chance to join a group that was doing similar things to the that we were trying to accomplish in non-competing markets. So the what we've learned from the franchises, and they're good and bad because dealer agreements can 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 hurt you down the road. Mm-hmm. I I have a dealer agreement with LeafGuard, and I I know how it's written. And there's there's obstacles for. Did you get out of it? No, uh-uh. I'm I'm still in it. Mm-hmm. Um, it. When we got into the LeafGuard franchise, my mom and Jimmy Olson, who was my dad's first ever employee, Melvin, he still works for us today. I don't care what he does, where he is, what he's working on. He can he has a job for the rest of his life. I know he's always working on something awesome, but he has no real particular job at Linus anymore except for helping where your help is needed, making the shop is look good. Is that just your way of be, being loyal? He held on to checks in the 80s. And ate dinner and breakfast with us, Dimitri. How do you? How do you let that person go? Yeah, and, you know my my peers will look at a book and say you got that salary going there, and say well, why? And like you don't understand. <laughs> I love it. You know, it's it's just uh, the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do, but that's how you get retention too. If you don't think the rest of everyone sees that, and this is how you sunset people, there is still loyalty to be had. Then, then that that's why you know if you take the, the the top fifty employees at Linux Construction now, I think it's over a thousand years of combined experience. Wow, you know it's like fifteen point eight years of average experience there. Um, it's it's a great group of people, and it makes makes my life easy. But nineteen ninety four, we were doing mainly roofing and siding, and by nineteen ninety nine with LeafGuard, it was eighty percent LeafGuard was our our revenue. We got out of roofing completely. In 1996, I want to say, wow. because of certainty. You know what's so cool? Uh, certainty. Uh, the whole thing about the United States. I moved to uh, to uh, Eagle River, Wisconsin, in 2005. It was a small city, 1500 population, right? As you mentioning all the years, like 94, I was like in third grade. Like in 1991, USR start collapse. Like in the past 50 years, there's so many things happening across the world. If you look at the United States for the past 50 years, like, I mean, you're telling me that you got a franchise in 1984, LeafGuard, and they're still around, and you can still see the brands. Like, you can study the brands. You have this huge history of, you know, um, capitalism, companies. Like, not much changed. Like, not much changed in the United States 
uh, things are changing, but like core values, core like you still can buy a franchise today, mm -hmm. you still can open a business, you still can. It just it blows my mind. Like people don't appreciate this country as they should. Like for all the opportunities, like where I come from, you know, I'll give you example. I w I was trying to get out of my dad, who my grandfather was, grand grandfather was, right? I mean, you have hundred years of history from like 1920s, 1930s. I mean, people were moved. Like someone would say like in 1920s, 1930s, but you know, government changed, right? They, you killed the Tsar, uh, Bolsheviks came in. It's like, okay, you guys, you're not gonna be in uh, Siberia. You're gonna go to Moldova. Like you just move. And then Stalin comes to power. It's like, oh, I need to build that bridge next to China, like 3000 miles away. I'm gonna move 3 million people to do that. Oh, by the way, I need it. And for the entire hundred years, like people like slaves, yeah. which is like 20th century, but still like slaves, like one person in charge or one regime or one party can tell you, okay, government needs you to do this and you're gonna go and do it. And like, I'll give you an example. Um, my grandfather was a coal miner. He was uh, in a, that's as dangerous Sub and tough a work as it gets. Yeah, a, a submarine. But he, he never joined Communist Party, never agreed to it. When he retired, he moved to Moldova. Anyway, long story short, like I'm just listening to the story, like stability that you guys have here, your dad has here. We don't have that stability over mm -hmm. there. Like we just don't. Like you don't have the power. They can take everything from you just like that. And you, you, there's nothing you can do about it. You can be oligarch, you can be billionaire. Like not only Russia, I'm talking about China. I mean, like in China, have you heard about billionaires like disappearing, mm -hmm. right? In Russia, the same thing. If government comes to you and say, oh, you have a couple billion dollars, you know, share, donate right there. <laughs> we need you to do this. Uh, here, 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 yep. <laughs> Crazy. And uh, I, 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 just, I just love it. I absolutely love it. Um, well, that's a fun part to see. Um, Besides like us being on the grow, I've watched countless other companies spawn off of Linus Construction mm -hmm. um, with our help and with our help. Uh, hey, I, I was speaking in a breakout for you. Mm -hmm. And in the breakout is a former roofing supervisor for us that was selling his own roofs and doing his own estimates while, while I was paying him, like working on my stuff. And like we, we ended up having to give him a choice. Like you can have your own roofing company or you can work for our roofing company. And he chose to go on his own. And he was in, in a breakout. And I, I root a guy like that on because, again, the opportunity here in America, I don't, I have enough to keep myself busy. And I truly, and that's why I've always loved you. You, you, you champion the, the small business opportunities here that are available. And, and I don't think anyone understands it as well as maybe you do what the opportunity is here. And that's why when, I know it was kind of tongue in cheek when I, I let off the, the the part at your conference with the South Park video, mm -hmm. but that South Park show, it's funny because it's kind of true. Handymen are taking over the world. Yep. Like it, the, the, with the opportunity now, both from starting a business, selling a business, joining, whether you want to be in private equity, public equity, a manufacturers, there's opportunity right now in home improvements oh, that, yeah. that, that we've never seen before. And they're even talking about a downturn in the economy next year, it's still hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars going to be spent on home improvements that, that we all have an opportunity to share. What's your take on all of this private equity money coming to the industry, good or bad? I, I see a lot of negative impact. I see money coming in, people take advantage of it. and uh, But I also have seen quite a few already collapsed. What do you see? You know, uh, I don't think I have enough information yet. And I, I've i seen good and bad. I think that there's an opportunity out there with the, with the right private equity groups that they're going to keep owner-operators in place. I think it'd be silly to try to remove some of these owner-operators from, from doing what they're doing and what they're good at. And knowing what I know about collaboration amongst contractors, if you can get into a group that, that truly is after the best idea, and those are these are people that are all pushing the bus in the right direction. Then, 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 it, yeah, it can be great. But I haven't seen that success. And for me, if it's right for the people and it's right for your customer, then then it's a good decision. 
and and we haven't we haven't crossed that bridge yet. But people close to us have, and they're having some some they're getting more sophisticated. The marketing apparatus is out there now. When it's 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 a lot harder to generate opportunities than it was a year ago. It just is because of the competition of it, and I think equity groups. But, but we always have competition. Is it because? Money coming in and people spending money on money. Yeah, I just think they're more sophisticated. You I take a, a three million dollar roofer, now you make them part of a two hundred million dollar organization or a billion dollar organization. Mm. They they have people behind them that are are a different caliber than 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 what a lot of us have have at our fingertips or the ability to to hire. So there's there's some of that, but it also puts a lot of people in in a position of fear where they feel like they have to make a deal now because it's going to go away. Or if I don't join, it's, I'm going to be hurt. And I don't, that's just never been a, a good spot to make a decision. It still has to be a good business decision. I think people have to do the math and, and to figure that part out. But I've, uh, I've had the opportunity to talk to pretty much every major group that is in the equity world. I can world. imagine. Um, Everybody's getting offers now. Yeah. And, and, uh, they're not all the same. All they right. just aren't. I I can tell you. An offer means nothing. And an offer they're, means nothing. <laughs> they're um, so generous with it. it. It is. I can and <laughs> it's crazy money sometimes. And and if it's enough money that that you can take care of a lot of people, then yeah, then and and that might be the right decision for you. But I don't know about you. It. Uh, we talk about first generation, second generation. The math tells me that the decision to try to make this a third generation company is a bad idea. Really? But the math also told my parents that mm -hmm. going from a first generation to a second generation company is probably a bad idea. Like the success rate of all of that mm -hmm. is pretty small. Mm -hmm. And it's markedly smaller going from second to third generation. So you you do have to have a proper succession plan and and my brothers and I are are trying to figure our way through that, but we have a we have a great thing going here too, so there's never any rush on 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 any of that. But oh. it's it's such a, a hard question to answer accurately because everything is different, every company is different, every every deal that I've seen is is seems to be they're they're all some are good, some are bad, but the the second bite that people are hoping on and, and that kind of stuff scares me a little bit. And I think that like you said, some of them are collapsing already and. There's probably going to be an opportunity for for somebody to buy a whole bunch of these companies for for less than they were paid for, and because they can't, they they all can't go well, right? They There's all can't too, go. Too many of them. They in, a lot of them don't do their homework. Um, there is some of that, and 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 the due diligence stuff. Uh, I'm sure is a pain in the butt for for a lot of people. Um, I know our software program. We're doing our our best to try to help people through that that process. Getting CRM data to line up with mm -hmm. financial data is always a uh, uh, a task, but we uh, we we try our best. And eventually, we were, we were talking. We're like, do we have to create a due diligence button in in our in our CRM? <laughs> like, all right, boom, here it is. Because like the amount of people asking, it's again, it's a but again, opportunity. Why? Why are they after it? Why wouldn't they be? Like, I, I can show you records of growth going back 20 years. Like the last time we had a, a really- T take, take me through. That's my actual next question. Um, take me through evolution of Lindus construction since 1994. So you, you got um, LiveGuard 94. What happened next? You know- um, I, uh, in the summer times, I was a downspout installer. We had one machine and with the, uh, and we, me and another kid hired on mom and dad in the summer times. And we dropped gutters for one other crew that had a van. And then we'd go to our job and install it right out of the machine. And I was the downspout guy that came behind them. And then at night, a couple of nights a week, I would go to malls around the Twin Cities metro area and have my kiosk water display set up. And I would get, I got paid by mom and dad per lead per opportunity. I spent as much money in these malls as I ever got paid. I can tell you that much. You know, you're going to put a 16 year old kid at a mall kiosk and, and give him 25 bucks. He's got probably going to spend it. But that was my real first interaction with in, in the sales world. And, and over, over from 94 to 97, my mom will tell you the story. She went to our, the first ever leaf guard annual meeting. Like they had this and everyone's going there and we'd done like 7,000 feet thinking, <laughs> boy big deal we were a big deal 
And I, I swear to God, this conversation happened. Um, like the next, like the top 10 all did over 75,000 feet. There was a couple that were doing 200,000 feet. And Jerry Dan, the gutter man, was the name of this company that's no longer around anymore, uh, sat down with my mom and Jimmy Olson. And he's like, well, let me take a look at your territory. And took out a map of the Twin Cities metro area. And you know we're located in western Wisconsin, about 45 minutes from downtown St. Paul. I have an office in Hastings now, and we're looking at a new location somewhere in the Twin Cities. Just from an SEO standpoint, I've been putting myself in a bad spot the last couple of years by not having that. He looks at the map and goes, so you guys do most of your work over here in western Wisconsin. But you understand most of the people are over here, right? Like his exact words to my mom was, and she's like, yeah. And it's just like getting over that hurdle that, that it's not that big of a deal to drive a half hour to the Twin Cities yep. and, and start to advertise a little bit there. Well, the next year we did over 70,000 feet. And like this year- 10X. Yeah, it's 500,000 feet of leaf garden uh, and downspout installed in the, in the Twin Cities metro area. Easy. So it's, 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 it's led to a lot of growth, but again, going to those meetings and collaborating. It's little things. How simple is that? But sometimes you need someone else to tell you that. Correct. And, and you have to be open enough to take that advice. I've, I'm really, really comfortable not being the smartest guy in the room. I can tell you that much. I never want to be the, the smartest guy in the room. I like to surround myself by really, really smart people. The person that runs my marketing, way better at it than me. My, my accountant, way better at me. My GM, my cousin Rick, he is the world's best production manager. He's done it all. He's a craftsman. He cares about the customer as much as anybody. And he runs that side of my business and looks at those numbers better than I ever did. Travis Gibson, my, my sales manager. He's, he won the, the Herb Cole Award uh, uh, in the state of Wisconsin for the best special educator in the state of Wisconsin. He's so much better at teaching than I am. And that's what a sales manager really does. He's, he's teaching and, and, and trying to get the transfer of belief, not only in what we do, but in some of our products and, and over to the, these new guys. It's, he's, he's better at it than I am. And, and, and that's okay. Uh, what's your biggest revenue jump in one year? Like you mentioned, going from seven thousand to seventy thousand in the well, in that time frame, a lot of things happened. We started up multiple locations, so we started up locations in Iowa, Omaha, uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Those were all That's locations. Overwhelming. Yeah, it's those were all locations owned by by Lindis, and at that point in time, I was running all of the sales. How and many the of marketing. them do you still have? Just just Lindis. Lindis. Just Lindis. Oh, sorry. Lindis in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. Um, those are the only two that we we have we have left. You sold them all? We sold them all. And these were my best people in the Twin Cities market that we gave the opportunity to go and start their own business in another territory. So when when 2020 happened. Why we, did you sell did you say to sell? You know, um, People have asked me this question a lot lately, and I just went over with my mom and with uh, Josh Keeney, who owned and operated our, our Nino location, which is Green Bay. He asked me the this, this same question. Why did we sell? If looking back at, at it now, knowing what the opportunities are out there with some of this, and a couple of them are joining equity groups. What, you know, could we have sold it all to a big, yeah. But you know what? I was doing $8 million of revenue in the Twin Cities market. And as I had 13 markets, I got up to $60 million in revenue. But because I was able to collaborate with some of my best friends and best employees in the history of Linus Instruction, while watching them grow their own businesses, the ideas that they gave me and helped me grow is why we're in one location now, just in the Twin Cities location, it's going to be close to $60 million in revenue this year. Mm. So- it, and again, I love how you've been teaching people, don't worry about the top line. No. Doesn't matter. It never matters. It's, it's the bottom line. line that counts. But yeah, maybe looking back, selling would have, wouldn't have, I, I, but I'm telling you, even knowing what I know today, and I probably left, you know, 300 million on the table or whatever the case may be, I wouldn't have changed a damn thing. Not a darn thing. Because one, I love watching those guys ride off into the sunset awesome. and have success. Two, I still get awesome ideas from them. I was on a conference call with them yesterday 
talking about roof repairs and how they're, they, they did roof repairs longer than I have. And so I'm picking their brain and they gave me everything. Like I'm not, I don't own part of them. I'm not partners with them anymore. Now they, they do use our software, but it, it's not, it's not that, that any ownership, but there is open book. You can't get that. I don't well, think without having at least some type of partnership or, or other relationship, it, it had to have lowered the learning curve for us as a whole. I know it did. And when you're placing advertising in 14 markets and having to buy the advertising, you get a lot of analytics that come at you. So you got a lot of information that maybe you wouldn't have it before. Um, the worst year you can remember in business? 2006. What happened? The first year I was in charge of all financials. So I'd spent the, the previous two years dividing up all the divisions. And the way I set it up at, at with my in-house accountant, my in-house CPA, was if it was a people expense and you were one-fifth of the people, you were taking one-fifth of that expense. If I couldn't put it at that division, if it was a vehicle expense and you were one-fifth of the vehicles and I couldn't put that vehicle directly at your division or that expense at your division, because certain things get, as you look at it, it's hard to separate. So I'm doing all this and we finally get it going on. We made money in, in 05. And everything was like the downturn in the economy the housing crisis is going on and everyone's talking about cutting, cutting, cutting. I refuse to cut. In fact, my marketing budget today is the exact same as it was that year. Wow. So, um, which is probably my volume that year did not support my marketing budget or some of my spends. I lost $500,000. That year? That year. And set up on a, a compensation program with my parents, you know, that uh, like, you know, just like everything, we all win, the company wins, the customer wins, we all win. Well, no one won, but the customer really that year, so we, we still took care of our customers, but it, it, it was an eye opener for me. And, you know, it took uh, t the next two years to, to, to use that loss against profits. But we've uh, have since 2006, we've shown a growth in profit almost every single year. Wow. And a lot of that has to do with, we've, again, our marketing budget and the people that we have in our office, those numbers haven't changed. Like the amount of people that we have working on the overhead at Linus Construction and the amount of dollars that we spend on marketing haven't changed since 2006. In fact, the amount of people in the office is actually two less than it was in 2006. So we, we were a little bit top heavy. But I wasn't going to cut people. I wasn't. I didn't cut a single benefit. I didn't cut anything. And now we're in the position again. And this is maybe where we're. If all that matters is the number, how do you make a decision to lose a year? Unless you're thinking long term, like it's I'm going to lose this year, so I can win the next five. Mm -hmm. And. That year, that downturn taught me that there's a gravitation towards quality of employers in those types of years. If you can demonstrate how you take care of your people during those tough times, then they'll be loyal to they'll you. Be, they'll be loyal to us. In, in, in during the COVID years, I was in constant communication with our people. I, I actually employed a PR firm to help me because I'm, I'm a terrible writer. And I didn't know how to communicate what I was feeling, what I was seeing. And I was just brutally honest with everything as we were, we were going through it. Mm -hmm. And we were able to add benefits and add pay to people because we ended up having the best year we've ever had. So every, we were named essential and everyone had to stay home. Mm -hmm. and, and at this point in time, we were down to just one location or the two locations. And so there's a lot more focus on, on, on the Twin Cities people. And so you go back to the worst year we've ever had. Yeah. Spent some money. We probably didn't. It was hard to come out of that, but I've kept a lot of people since then. Like I have a lot of people that were with the company in 2006 that are still here. So that experience is, is hard to pay for. And now we're in an opportunity where we're, we're talking about things like giving everyone 50% off their healthcare plan next year. Wow. Um, but there's, there's things you can do. And it, you're talking about a downturn in the economy. Time to double down on your people. How far are you planning in business? Like one, two, three, five years? Uh, I have a five-year plan always that we constantly update on our software side of our business, contractor flow. Right now we have our releases planned out through 2027. 
So we've planned things out far enough, and that way we can look at those plans and try to accelerate where we need to. But we have exact plans on on what we want to do, and and everything gets refined. Like as you of course. You, you you can move the goal line, you got to be okay with that, and it's but you need to plan that. Um, one of my favorite books is uh, Principles by Ray Dalio, mm -hmm. and you know, and the New World Order book. I don't know, it's kind of a love letter to China a little bit, but it uh, still he made me think a lot about not only the the Chinese ability to plan for five, ten, fifteen, twenty, hundred year plans, mm -hmm. you know, and and the records that they have going way back when that made you kind I mean, of think a little bit. When someone achieves something, you better pay attention why they achieve it and yeah. how did they do it. Yeah, exactly. It works. And and so you see, like when you plan out your work and you have those types of principles for decision making, and that's the the first real. Again, I love friends because it was a friend that gave me that book, and I couldn't like I I read it and I read it again, and we started refining everything. Hmm. And and looking at it like this is why I make the decision and give it to your people. Now they don't have to ask me; they know why, and I can just look at the results, which is the the kind of personality I'm in. Show me the cake; I don't need the recipe. Wow! Re reverse <laughs> engineer everything. I mean, this is it. it there, it's so easy to be successful now because of that. You can go to YouTube. You, the, the information is there. You know, you can you can reverse engineer any company, any software. By the way, on your uh, software company, I remember you were telling me you were spending three hundred thirty thousand dollars on the, on uh, Salesforce, and like back in two thousand eighteen, mm -hmm. a year. Uh, that was all is I your was. CRM, spending. your cake. Yes, <laughs> CRM is my cake. Um, we spent a lot of money on our CRM. Uh, we, I had a, a seven hundred thousand dollar build that we scrapped at one point in time. Uh, Salesforce is not the easiest platform to build anything on, for the most part, and it took us a minute to wrap our heads around it. But right now, I have better information and more information than any company I've had the chance to look into. Mm -hmm. And like you said, these are educations that you can get almost free. Like Salesforce has trailheads and I'll put you down and make you learn anything. YouTube has about as much any. You don't need to be a Harvard MBA. Sure. You don't have to go to college to get a lot of this stuff figured out. You can. In fact, one of the, the guys I was talking today about being a potential customer, like uh, he figured out Excel on his own. Like if you can figure out how to make your own spreadsheet and Excel, like you're a hundred percent capable of, of running the, your own CRM and making it do what you do. Everyone thinks that, that it should come out of the box ready to go. And Salesforce definitely doesn't do that. And that's why we built contractor flow was to, again, to try to help measure everything. And we had built all these companies that we were selling off There's that, that, that were on our org, on our system. So they needed their own system. So we had to repeat that a little bit. And Rodney was asking me for like four years to try to build something. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to get into the 75 CRMs out there. And like, there's like five that came to me within the last year to promote. I'm like, how, like my next question would be about that. How does contractor pick the CRM? What advice would you give someone to, you know, brand new in the market or maybe have a business, small business, couple of million dollars, how to pick a CRM? Like when there's 75 of them, your, your owner has, you have to be all in on it. The guy in charge, who's ever think can't be, all right, I want my, I'm going to give this to my people and let them figure it out. That doesn't work. You need to be on the front end as you're picking it. Whatever system you're on using, you need to be on the front end so you know what it's capable of. Because when you don't know that, you end up getting this system and then you don't quite like that. So you add this system, then you don't quite like that. And then you add this system. Next thing you know, you're struggling to make a 2% net profit because you're paying all of this stuff and you really don't know what your numbers are or you haven't set it up well enough because you don't know what I saw. There was a, I've seen people that were using Leap, people that were using Job Nimbus at tables talking, teaching other people how to set up flows. The collaboration amongst amongst people. That's mm -hmm. that, I mean, that when you can figure out how to set up your own flows and whatever CRM you're using, then then you're going to, it's going to be successful for you because you're, you, you can mold it to do what you want it to do. And I, I'm not as familiar with Job Nimbus or Leap or any of those, mm -hmm. but what, what that was telling me is there is, is people, whatever CRM you pick, it's going to be as good as you want it to be. 
and to use. It's what you use. It's not, yeah. Yeah. But why we chose the Salesforce platform is, and why we decided to build one is because none of them did what we wanted them to do. I have zero data entry people at Linux Construction. Not a single person enters any type of data. All the data that comes to me is from people doing their job, whether it's for it's time stamped, whether it's what they're entering as they're they're selling the job or what's automatically done. There's AI that generates products that automatically get picked behind the scenes. There's there's a, a lot of things that that we've implemented that make it that there's easy buttons for for a lot of people. But I wanted to make it because every time I've had a data entry person do anything, they mess up. They transpose a number. It's, it's another chance for human error. Does it talk to your accounting? Correct. So it's all 100% tied in. Our, all, all of our accounting software is built on, on financial force and Linux construction and contractor flow has connectors, a uh, connector coming out for Sage and there's a connector for, for, for QuickBooks as well. Salesforce has a lot of these things built and you can change the language. If, you know, language is as a second language for you, there's, there's an opportunity. You, Salesforce is as mm. good a bilingual as, as any of the CRM platforms are out there. So we chose Salesforce because of the, the pliability of it, the, our ease of working with it. We can make it do what we want it to do, so much so that my managers get an alert when our lead times get to whatever time I, I set it at. And it starts telling them, if you hire this many people, this is what your lead times go down to. If it hires this many people, this is what your lead times go down to. My appointment centers, we've figured it out. Like, you know, my, my call center is two people deep, Dimitri. I have two people that set 12,000 opportunities a year. Wow. And that list constantly updates and changes to put the highest probability prospect at the top of the list. And like our average conversion rate of, of internet leads is over 80% almost every month. That's an incentive that we have because I, if I do that and I pay a, pay a pretty good incentive, I know that Alexis and Callie are going to log in at night and on the weekends when, whenever an opportunity hits our org, we try to get it back in touch with them within two minutes. If we do that, we, we, we convert it all. Love it. Um, you mentioned Rodney Webb. Uh, when did he came around and what's your take on, like, how did he affect your business? <laughs> I mean, I know the answer to it. This is for the audience. You know what? I had a guy at your conference ask me, he goes, is it just, there's no way that that many people say the same thing about Rodney? I'm like, what do you mean? He was like, well, every time I ask somebody about Rodney, they say he changed my life. Okay. Rodney has done more for me than any other human on the planet outside of my mom and dad and, 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 and more for my family, more for my wife and me, more for, you know, than, than, and, and, and there's a lot of people that'll tell you that about him. So I can tell you, one of the people from your conference uh, yesterday called me or not yesterday, the day before called me and talked to me about it. Pretty large company, um, been around for a long time, like 40 years. And they're looking at adding, adding Rodney. And then they called uh, a company out of uh, Mississippi. And this person just started working with Rodney. And Mississippi is one of the hardest states in the freaking union to do, to do business. I mean, it's tough. It's there. I love this, this guy. He's a grinder and he gets after it. But when he started Rodney, he lost his entire sales team. Mm. And this year he's going to do marketably more than he did the year that he had that sales team. Wow. So here's his latest person that you can talk to or me. And how both of us said the same thing. How often does that happen when the writing comes in? You know, I, a lot less than it used to, I think. Um, I, I haven't heard that story for like a decade. I've worked for him almost 20 years. But I also know that, that we went and did a site visit at this person's roofing company. And the guy came over and put a stack of envelopes in front of Rodney. 17 envelopes. The reason I know it's 17, because he has 17 employees. Every single one of his employees wrote a handwritten note thanking Rodney, telling him how much he's changed their life in a year. Wow. It's, the guy truly doesn't worry about money because it's going to come to him. All he cares about is making you better and helping you. And when Clay got up and, and talked about that, and like you can call him on his phone, like he answers. He does. Always. And, 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 and you know that he'll, yeah. he'll talk to you till 
whenever. Like it, it's just, it's just what he does. And boy, if I'd have listened to him so much earlier, earlier too. When you th- when you think about that. So uh, guide me through first year. So how did you find him? What's the first couple changes he did for your business? Like it was 2004. Yeah, yeah, some somewhere in there, 2004, 2003. I want to say. Um, we went to a, a meeting that Englert was putting on, and, and Rodney was just getting started. Just I believe left Dixie, had started up uh, the the real gutter protector out of Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, was working with. Uh, masterminds or whatever did like was going to do a conference for them. This is before he did the mastermind conference with like Jody Rookstall. There's 50 dealers for leaf guard sitting in a room in Chicago. My brother, Alex and me and my cousin, Joe, who's running our Rochester, Minnesota office at this time. And now he owns the Des Moines office. These contractors hated him. Like they're just giving him the business. They don't believe anything he's saying. And Rodney's going through his 10 step process. Like this is like what I do. That's what I and then what I do and what I do. And, it's, and the whole time I'm in my head, I'm like, that's repeatable. Like I can teach that. And I've been struggling to try to figure out how I can teach what I'm doing. I was running, you know, five to seven opportunities a day at this point in time and trying to sell whatever I could. And, and then I'd, I'd, my way of training a salesperson was, all right, get in the truck teach them how to measure, give them a flip book and send them on the way. So many people still do that. Uh-huh. And <laughs> so I'm watching this guy speak and and and, and it, the guy that's giving him the the bit hardest time, I didn't like at all. Like he always gave me the creepy crawlies and it always thought that like he it was always about him. Like every conversation was about how awesome they were, never helped, like and he like would be like he talked down to you and I I remember looking at my brother Alex and like if that guy doesn't like him chances are this guy's brilliant then. That was my thought process. So I'm like, I disagreed with that guy on everything he's ever said. And if he hates Rodney that much or comes across like, because he's like 91% my ass that was actually said to Rodney in a meeting. And he's like, you know, he shakes it off and then he just moves on. So I took Rodney aside and asked him how much to come to Baldwin, Wisconsin. And it was more money than I had ever spent on anything. At that point in time. And in fact, I got yelled at by my father about it. I can imagine. And How much money was it? Five grand. Five grand. That's so cheap. I would love to get the writing for five grand. Hey, <laughs> he hasn't raised my price since that day. Wow. Because he charges you enough to make you do it. Loyalty. And, and, and why would he? You know, we're going to continue to do it. Now, I didn't listen to everything he said, but for me, the, and, and, and we've evolved. Okay can imagine we weren't talking about a video walk around yeah, yeah. back then um but and when we first started we had you know silly things like tie downs that, that like for the first six months and we got rid of those almost immediately and the production uh the the part step six of the thing was called the junk pile it was where you're showing people like other gutter products yeah, yeah. and it <laughs> just stupid stuff but we've all evolved but it gave us something to practice Gave us something to do. And what we did, we started practicing our pitch. Like, what are the cool things about LeafGuard? And I can still to this day draw a house upside down and put the flashing where the gutter goes in there and how the water goes around and all the leaf. Like I can, we practiced that all the time. And then we started tracking things. And I got a customer by the name of Gary Byron that worked for big time corporations all over the world, like ran a $40 million organization in Taiwan was his last job. And we put siding and roofing on his house and gutters. And I get to talk to him and he sees that we're growing and he ends up talking to my dad and mom a little bit. And my mom and dad hire him to be a a consultant to me. And, and I want to say that was it again, 2004, 2005, so right around that same time frame. So I have Rodney, I'm trying to teach him stuff. And now I have goals. Like I just, my mom, I'll show you, show you that later. The stretch goal was $4.2 million that year for the Twin Cities market for the year. That's a bad month now. And it, it, time changed. The times changed. But I didn't think about all I have to do is generate this many opportunities. And then everything else takes care of itself. 
But if you don't have a sales system, it doesn't matter how many opportunities you generate because you mm -hmm. can't guarantee how many you're going to sell. Like I can tell you if I generate this many opportunities, I'll be within 5% of my bottom line on how many opportunities we generate predicting 2024. Wow. Like I can, in fact, I would be willing to bet a lot of money. I can tell you exactly where the financials are going to be in July right now. Well, one, times haven't changed. We, we still have 250, 300 roofs that needs to be installed in the spring. Wow. That's, that's I, re <laughs> I remember that's what I, I'm, uh, my golden state told me in 2015, you have 250 to install. Mm -hmm. Now it's 320. Yeah. It's, uh, again, but 51% of our business comes from past customer repeats. You know what, Dimitri? I love the branding people that, that you talked about. Because people ask me that a lot. Mm -hmm. the, how do you build a brand? And I, I always tell them, don't use your name. Okay. It took me 30 years, took us 30 years to really have this name mm -hmm. mean something. In fact, the LeafGuard brand was a better brand and a more recognizable brand in the Twin Cities market than Linda's Construction was at one point. We've been able to flip the script a little bit there as we add more products. But I don't know if I, I, I know I wouldn't use Lindis in our name had I had to do it over again. Mm. In fact, we thought long and hard when mom and um, Adam and Alex and I bought it from them about maybe like at least getting the word construction. Mm -hmm. We put Lindis roofing in there or Lindis exteriors or whatever. But again, using something different than your name is important. But for us, the key has always been doing good work. Why we have a great brand. And why we get 51% of our business from past customer repeat referrals is that we tend to do good work. We stand behind what we do. We have good reviews. Like our reviews right now is we had Lindis do our decking. We had Lindis do our roofing. We had Lindis do our windows. And I would gladly choose Lindis to do our, whatever sure. our next product project is. Question um, on your reviews. I actually have it here. Um, how do you deal with a price was high reviews? So you have 4.6 stars, but I've seen quite a reviews, like negative reviews, but people did not hire you because you were the highest bidder. Um, that's okay. My shit ain't cheap. I'm, I'm okay with that as a review. Um, and, and, and to be honest with you, on, on that same token, if we make you unhappy and you tell me $2,000 is going to make you happy off, I'm ripping your roof off and redoing it. I'm not giving you two grand back. So, and, and I try to explain that to people. I could do my price cheaper. Well, I look at that, that's an opportunity for the salesperson to learn because that conversation should have happened while we were out there. Well, we can show you how we can make this cheaper, but I won't do it that way. Like one of the, the greatest things for me is I'm not dealing with a bunch of crap my dad put on the wall in the 80s and 90s. Hmm. Just not. I have one person in my service department for LeafGuard and one person in my service department for everything else. In fact, most of the service at Linus Instruction is, is self-created by my quality control specialists. They go out to job sites and point out things that we did wrong to the homeowner to, to redo it. Like, uh, you want to compete in this world? Don't race to the bottom. It's, it's it get Try to be a craftsman and be the best at something. And it doesn't have to be being the best at everything. Like, and, and this is how I set up the entire company. My roofers only roof. My siders only put on siding. My gutter guys only put on gutters. My window guys only put on windows. My decking guys only do decking. My insulators are just insulators. You have to. It's, you get better at it that way. Plain and simple. Uh, my question about family. So you bought your business from your parents. Is your parents uh, involved at all in, yeah. the, in yeah. the business now? Talk to them all the time. They're not involved in the day-to-day -day at all but they're involved in the business owner venting that their sons have to do. And what I mean is like they, that there's emotions that happen in business and there's things and experiences that only my parents know. Like my parents have started multiple, multiple businesses and sold them and have owned the real estate and to have, have people renting from them and then have to move the real estate. They've gone through downturns. 2017, I called my dad because I was beside myself. I'd never needed more roofing installers than I needed at that point in time because I had some, some laborers that, that, that had gone to other markets and I just couldn't fill and my backlog 
was mm-hmm. getting to the point where I was literally having people give me $30,000 down and saying, see you in 54 weeks. How do you do that? How do you, how do you measure the the price increases that you're going to experience over the year? And, and come like, I called my dad up and I was like, ah, <laughs> you'll figure it out. Don't worry. But he knew I kind of made me angry. I'm like, that's, that's your advice. But he just knew, like, you're going to have to buckle down and, and grind it out. I remember I was at every hotel in Brooklyn Park and Blaine. I was at at night. I was walking around talking to laborers. I was, really? I, 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 in the summer of 2017, I roofed for 60 days straight. You did? I did. You, you on the roof? On the roof. nail gun? With a nail gun, running shingles up there, supervising roofs, getting materials, finding, finding. I, I, did, I did it all. And I wasn't, the, I'm not a great installer. I love being out there in the world again and actually being on a job. And in fact, this year, it's like going to be a big part of my job is going to be in the field hmm. because I don't have admin work to do anymore. I don't have data entry to worry about. I don't have... Anything. I got four reports to look at. Are you excited about it? You seem excited about it. Yeah. Looking look at computer screens are fun and, and and not being, but I'm a grinder, man. I'm, I identify more as a roofer than a CEO. I could tell you that much. Let me ask you this uh, about your family. Um, why? So the, the way I wrote it, like why everyone is saying doing business with family is a bad idea. Like, when is it bad and when is it good idea? Like, working with your family, working with your brother, bringing your kids in, working with your, with your parents. You know the saying, it's very popular. People say, like, bring your family business in business and it's a bad idea. And a lot of coaches teach that. What, what do you answer to that? It's a bad idea if you don't, if you can't be objective. If they're getting the job because they're family. Hmm. That's different than getting the job with family because they earned it or they deserve it. I think that um, where I see troubles, that that's where the troubles lie. Um, sole proprietors, it sometimes can get overwhelmed and trust family to do mm. so much that they, they just don't get accomplished or they don't they, they feel like they can put things in their path or their plate and then don't follow up on it to make sure it's getting done. Your family members, just like any other employee, you need to have a way to hold them accountable and a way to measure their success and then be able to show them that. If you're not having regular meetings discussing that, then you're the one at fault, not that family member. So you got to be really careful because if you have a business relationship go south with the family member, now you not only have a business relationship that went south, you have a family member that went south. I'm blessed because I have two brothers. Partnerships out of all of the things that I've seen fail, the two people in charge seems to be the worst because for us majority rules and if we don't disagree we trust each other enough that two of us can't be wrong there's a reason why the two are leaning that way if you're the one on the outside you just have to submit that was a great word you used at your conference submit to the other two surrender and surrender that this is the way we're going to go and and you get to say, "Hey, I told you so." But down the road, you, you know, we can still play that card. We're brothers. We're gonna we're gonna be okay. Mm-hmm. But move on to the next thing and 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 figure it out. But we siloed ourselves too. Where I was marketing, my brother Alex was sales, and my brother Adam was production. And now my brother Alex runs contractor flow. My brother Adam helps him with contractor flow and still oversees our GM. And I run sales and marketing at, at Linux Instruction, but I'm going to be, my marketing side of the thing is going to be working with crews and working on on job sites and trying to, again, be, the way I look at it, the more I'm out there, the more I'm going to learn from my people on what they like and don't like about the job. And if I can improve their jobs, I'm going to improve the experience for my customers. Mm. And if I can do both of those things, chances of me to be able to grow are good. Like we've added, we're finishing this year at Linux Instruction plus 16. So what does that mean? That means that we're 16 people stronger this year than we were last year. Oh, I see. And, but it's not easy. So here's a statistic that's gone sideways for us. On here where we suck, 53 new hires this year. Uh, 28 of them didn't make it a week. Wow. So, 
Do, do you feel like it's your company culture or is it a work ethic of new applicants or hires? Well, I can only fix me. Sure. So the way I'm going to attack it is, is what do we have to do to get better at retaining people the first How week? was it before compared to like five years ago? You know, well, five years ago, I didn't measure it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's less than it was last year. Hmm. Like we have a, we have a, we have a, we have more people that, that left us in a week this year than, than the previous year. Hmm. And, and for us, if we can make them like our retention rate passed, if we give, if we get you to last 60 days, it's like a, a crazy high percentage of retention to year three. So we have data going back five years now, previous five years, I have data, but not the data that I have now. And I had to wrap my head around that. That's okay. It still helps me know whether I'm winning or losing. You know what I'm most excited about? I look at three-year averages all the time and getting 2020 off our books from our three-year average <laughs> is going to be the, it's going to make winning easier because it literally was like lead costs, best ever. I gave away $200,000 in advertising that year to the Make-A-Wish Foundation and uh, Second Harvest Heartland because I didn't want to cut the advertising, but somebody called me with 60 days to get an estimate. Like, why would I run an ad? Definitely not going to run a discount. <laughs> you know, wow. it, it, it's one of those years that it was, again, the easiest time in the history of mankind to do home improvements. Well, we have, it's, for many, it felt bad, but for many, it changed. I mean, like auto industry, like, you know, look at the car pricing. Like there are so many things changed. If you're an entrepreneur, you'll figure out how to get the best out mm -hmm. of the worst. And that's why I feel like most good businesses are not afraid of downturn. We're actually waiting for it. Like for me, it's like, oh, economy is gonna fall good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like there goes there goes a couple competitors. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So let's talk about our industry really quick. I have about 10 questions about the industry, and I have five what I would the last categories. Um The most profitable trades in construction, in your opinion? Mm. Oh, the most profitable trades in construction. It really is a, a, a loaded question because um, it can be marketably different from one company to another when it, when it comes to a trade. I found that, that specializing in something is, is better than trying to do it all. Um, 100%. And, doing less is doing more. and when it comes to the trades, maybe not having every type of roofing is the right way to go for us. Like going a hundred percent with, with GAF has always been the best decision for us. It's, it's helped us have a partnership. It's helped us have the bottom line. It's helped us do, do whatever with same thing with leaf guard. Same thing with, with windows. I mean, we're a hundred percent all in with infinity. I'm not selling 64 different types of windows or doors pro via. Like I try to find a manufacturer and make a partnership there and, and talk to them about what my pricing is, what my, what my mm -hmm. goals are, where my bottom line is. And then you need to find out your break even, you know, you need to know what you need to do each is month. Is that the most important question? Is it the most important metric to measure for the business owner? Uh, uh, if you want to profit every month. Yeah. <laughs> But most of them don't even measure their financials monthly. Hmm. We find a lot of people that do it quarterly or twice a year or whatever, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Do you have red months in, uh, because you're in Wisconsin, you're up north? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. But have, you can. Ha, did you like the in plan, the past, in the, the winter times? Yeah, the the, the plan you, right now does not have a red, red month. Got it. We can install a lot of things in the winter. But I know what my break even is in January and February and how much dollars we have to install those month and, and each division knows. Because ro roofing is gone. Do you install gutters in the winter? Yeah, but repairs are still there. Repairs are there. Okay. Repairs are still there. Insulation is still there. As long as there's not a lot of, not, lot of snow on the roof, we can still do a lot of gutters. Mm -hmm. um, some armor shield or class four shingles can get installed in the wintertime if you're going to hand seal. So some new con will get done. Mm -hmm. And we, we have some additions going on that we'll have to do. Metal roofing. We will still do a little bit of that. Uh, our window department will install pretty much all winter long. Mm -hmm. You know, a polar vortex happens and, you know, it's 20, 30 below. Probably not going to be, you know, nothing, Fr no, no glues. Your cars don't even work well <laughs> to get to the job site that day. Um, 
our decking crews aren't going to do a lot in the in the winter time. So they'll transition to doing some more in house stuff and mm -hmm. and and with our. But we try to do as much as we can, and and we will be the first ones out the gate. Like as soon as because you have a backlog. You're, yeah, I have the you're backlog. Waiting for it. Like not just first ones out the gate. Like as soon as we have the green light, I'll have six dumpsters and six six jobs going daily, right. right? from from the start next year and and once we get past road restrictions and stuff like that we'll we'll crank it up even 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 farther but we we again if you plan it and and people always how do you tell people you're you're 3 months out or 4 months out it's like i don't know i've been around since 1979 why don't you ask them why they can install it tomorrow Wow, I think that that that's that, a great answer. That the answer to that question is 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 more interesting to me than why I'm why why can't I install it for four months? Because I'm awesome. <laughs> We're really good at what we do. My team is is in demand, and our customers are the best. I don't so it actually know. helps you to sell at a higher price and everything else. Being in I, yeah, I'm not looking for every job. I don't want them all, Dimitri. Let me ask you this question: uh, Is customer always right? Oof. No, but their happiness is the always the most important. Great answer. Um, and I think that there's a way you can demonstrate where the customer is wrong. Like there's certain things that a customer wants done on a project. And if you don't think it's the right way or it's going to be the most durable way or the most long lasting way, it's up to you to educate that customer mm. and let them know. Just, you know, you go into a, a doctor's office and he says you need heart surgery and you say, nah, it's my foot that's bothering me. You know, the doctor is going to explain to you why you need to, do, and again, that's a, it's widely, maybe it's not the, the most accurate analogy I could, I could paint, but it's not that far off. Like, you know more about this house than, than the homeowner typically does. Now they live there, they understand what's going on, but with today's tools that we have to diagnose what's going on. And for me, you know, as a roofer, and a gutter person and an insulator and a guy doing windows, how a house operates and works and breathes is important. Mm. So you need to go into that understanding. If my salespeople look at a roof and don't look at the attic, I'm going to be upset. Like we have systems in place to, 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 to know because if a customer calls me and they have ice dams that they've never had before, I'd like to know what their insulation and ventilation was before I did the roof. I need to have that measured. I need to be able to know that we had that conversation because typically we can look at that and know what should be done and, and give our recommendations on the front end. Like, hey, you need to do this, this, and this, or an ice dam cracker. On you. With that, my next question is, is it harder or easier to please a customer in 2023 versus, let's say, 90s or 2000s? Easier. Easier? Easier. People are easier, not pickier? I think customer service is poor. So people's expectations maybe aren't as as mm. much as they used to be. I don't think it's hard to make people happy today than it was in, in the 90s. Because popular opinion amongst contractors is opposite. Like most people think it's harder. People, I, there's a lot of Karens out there. Yeah, there's maybe some of that. There's maybe there's some people that, that are- Maybe we just exaggerate. Easier to complain. I think it's it's no more noticeable because it's online. Mm -hmm. But- I think it's easier today to get somebody to give you a five star review than it was. I agree with two that. years ago because people are used to it. They are people are used to give hey, ratings. I I don't I haven't reviewed anything like ever. I put my first two Google two Google reviews ever in my life were 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 my uh, restaurant and roofing insights was my second review. I saw that. Uh -huh. I appreciate that. Yeah. By the way, you guys can do that too. Roofing Insights have page too, and we need reviews just like everyone else. But no, that's awesome. It's true because behavior is there. Like now every Uber drive, you know, if you finish the ride, like give five stars. People just used to, it's almost like a form of payment. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's up to the business to make it easy because if you, like, you know what I hate? You go to the store, let's say Best Buy, and you get a receipt or Home Depot. It's like, rate me here. Like, if I have to do five steps to review you, I'm not doing it. Uh -uh. But if it's clicking, but like, yeah, might as well. I will, especially if I had a good experience. Exactly. Um, if I had a good experience, and the reason why I gave my first ever Google review was I was in 
Mississippi. We're at a, at that 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 roofing friend of mine's place, and we're in a, mm-hmm. at a restaurant. We had some of the best service by a bar and restaurant that I've had in six months. Mm. And I don't go to many places. I didn't out to eat or, or, but they were out of their way to make us happy. And I said, Hey, you guys did a great job tonight. And he's like, ah, oh, thanks man. Would you mind giving me a review? Who says no to that? If you just told them how great of a job they did and immediately followed up. I'm like, all right, now I got to figure out how to do a Google review. So <laughs> me and, um, uh, another roofer, uh, from from the New Jersey Philadelphia area, that's who I took the picture with that night. Uh, did a five star review, and then and then uh, like three days later, I got, hey, if you're at my conference, we to give roofing insight. I'm like, I know how to do this now. I got it on lockdown. <laughs> uh huh. Love it, uh, love it, love it. Most underrated marketing. It's a good question. Um, people never like my answer, <laughs> and. And we get asked that about referrals and and past customers, how we get so much of mm-hmm. that to go up. Consistency, like anything, is is the key. As you can see, not as consistent lately. I may be on uh, my diet and working out as I should have been. So this, I'm probably in that that two two forty oh, compared to yeah. Anyhow, um, <laughs> but if on every single customer they get a handwritten thank you note, and on every single job you install, the salesperson stops by and checks in on it. And then also hands things out to the neighbors. If you do that on every single mm. job, your referral rate will go up. Mm. Your past customers' experiences will go up. What you can sell to those people down the road will go up. So for us, my entire advertising plan is online at online and past customer repeat. And the one radio show I do every Saturday. And I've been doing that for better part of 20 years as well. And, and I, if I didn't have the radio show, I probably wouldn't be advertising on the radio. I think all of the, your efforts should be with things like directory, SEO, SEM, and what can you do to generate more referrals and to make your customers happier? Because that from the long game is really, really, really important. Like why my life gets easier and why my advertising budget is around 2% of our sales and why it hasn't increased since 2006 is because we focus in on our customers as much as we can. We focus in on our people as much as we can and we do those little things. Like like most of my customers get a cooler. Wow. We talk about branding. And that's you branding, see this, by the way. It is. It is. It is branding, and it's just what I like. There's a portion of my advertising budget that goes toward branding, and and it's it's a Yeti cooler or a Yeti mug People that that customers it. get depending on how many dollars they spent at at Linus Construction, and and we don't tell that to customers ever. We never like our customers never know about the Yeti coolers until they get one in the mail, or they get one dropped off at their house by. I'll, by I'll a customer. interrupt you really really quick on that note. Uh, one of the most popular methods of, especially storm chasers love it, they pay for referrals. What's your take on that? Just curious. <laughs> Paying 200 bucks to refer a customer. Well, um, I think you have to have that referral program. Mm-hmm. What I always tell- What's we, yours looks like? Ours is uh, $150. Mm-hmm. You refer anyone to us, we're going to get in and they end up using us. You're, we're going to send a $150 check off to to that customer. And that we've wow. had it that way for, for 20 years. Wow. But- but We're seeing a lot of people use different mugs and, and, and different coolers and people go away from the Yeti because it's a little bit more expensive, but they always tell me like, well, this one's just as good as the Yeti. Hmm. Well, this one's just as good as the Yeti. And I said, well, as soon as yours is the one that you're measuring it against, then that's the brand I want to be associated with. So true. <laughs> so same with for, the cups, same with, same with the cups, same, same with everything. It's like, uh, it's just as good as the Yeti. As soon as it's just as good of an as an RTCI or whatever the OtterBox or who, you name it, then that's the one my customers will get. Wow. The same the same reason why when I walked in here, I got a directory Cutco knife, the best knife manufacturer on the planet, baby. I love my Cutco salesperson, by the way. I learned from him um, how he texts me. That guy gets me at the weirdest times and the weirdest. Like I, I I don't say yes to him all the time, but I say yes to him at least a couple times a year. And he texts me on a regular basis and he's like, hey, we got this deal. And or this deal is going away soon. I'm like, uh, I'm a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. Me too. Loaded question now. 
uh, I was renting RVs for five years from the same place here in Fridley and loved it. Like family business, you come there, like they know me by name. Like I've rented buses, trailers. Last summer I came there, gone. Business is closed. And they've been there for years, lots of reviews. So they closed the business. I ended up buying an RV because I cannot rent it anymore. I'm like, I'm not going to rent it from any other place. So I bought a trailer. So my question is, why so many businesses close? And that seems like very nice. My wife was like, really? They closed? Like, you have a family business. Uh, you mentioned that early on, like accounting, CPA told them bankruptcy route could be the case. I do see that pattern. Like, I do see a lot of roofing companies fold. Even if it's multiple people involved, family involved, it's always devastating. What's What do you find number one reason for business closures You've been in business for over 40 years. You've seen a lot of companies closing doors. What, not changing. Not changing. Not adapting. Not adapting. Um, I don't have a single product I'm installing today that I did 20 years ago. Wow. Powerful. Like, so, and as I told you, you know, me personally, my wife and I had children at 19. So for then there wasn't time to do anything. It was grind, 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 grind. So I pointed my entire life at 43 when I turned 43, which was, you know, two years ago. Because that's when I became an empty nester. Like my youngest went off to college. So my wife and I were gonna do some traveling. As I was to talked to you, I don't know, a couple of days ago, the reason why I wanted to, you know, be at Roofing Insights and why I went to Quality 500 and why I'm going to Wealth Builder, why I'm going to Quality Room Modelers Tech Conference and other conferences is to check back in because I've checked out a little bit the last couple of years and it maybe put me at a disadvantage on where these new, now, the manufacturers haven't exactly innovated anything in the last two years, by the way. They repackaged some things <laughs> and we got a different color or different warranty or whatever the case may be. They're making less colors now. They're making less colors than, than they did. So it's, I, it's not that I missed a lot, but from the sales and marketing side, from the coding side, from the people side and what other people were trying and being able to, to have those open, honest roundtable conversations that I got as much out of your conference as I gave. I can tell you that much. Like I know why I, where I got better. I'll give you, give you an example. The, the, where we are talking earlier, Clay. Okay, Clay was teaching about the reference list. And I've sold the reference list that way forever. One of the things that we're doing though is when we're selling the job, we're taking the picture. And this is maybe, again, I, I really never talk about, this is not my thing to teach, how to teach it. You want to learn really how to do this? You could hold a Rodney Webb. This is his deal. But Clay taught me the reason why we go back to the job. Like I have a salesman who's been with me for 17 years. Doesn't, you know, he's got customers been there forever, da, 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 probably doesn't need to go and check in on every single sold job. But the transfer of belief on what we do and how we do it, especially for somebody new, the more jobs you go to, the easier that's going to be able to describe to the customer. And how that makes the customer feel when that person shows back up there. So I was, what I was thinking, hitting the easy button, taking the picture right when we sell the job, and then we'd call and follow up with the customer and make sure that they're happy and then ask them to be on a reference list. I, I dumbed it down to think of making it easier, but easier is not always better. And what I've, what I've found is where, where some of these, these, these companies that, that struggle and go out of business, it's their lack of ability to change or the head person checks out and has nobody else, no succession plan. Yeah, I've been, I was maybe a little bit more away from the day-to-day -day stuff the last couple of years. But, but I was in touch with my people and my customers always. Mm -hmm. And I have analytics that I look at daily that tell me what's going on in the business. And I know if you can't measure your business and whether you're winning or losing, you're going to lose. And if you're not trying to get better, you're going to get worse. It's just, I've never, that's, that, those two truths have never steered me wrong. Measure as much as you can to figure it out if you're winning. And if you're not, if you don't have a clear and concise plan for improvement, you will be getting worse. Because I've never, in in my history of, of being in business, or personally even, have had a status quo year. I've either dipped or rose. Hmm. So I always try to find the, the pathway to rising. Can you give me three numbers that you check 
every month? Business. Uh, yep. I'm going to know my gross margins uh, across divisions. No, no matter what. So I'm going to see my, my gross margins in leaf guard, my gross margins in roofing, my gross margins in repairs, my gross margins in decking, my gross margins in windows by project and by calculated projects. So I'm going to know my, my, my gross margin always. And then my opportunity count. Is it similar between all the tr uh, different trades or it, yes. it varies? It's all similar. W what are you shooting for? I'm, I, I'd like to see above a 50% gross profit. And, and, and I think that's doable across, across all boards. Now, the next thing I want to look at is opportunities. I need to know how many opportunities I have in the coffer and where the schedule is. And then schedule for the sales appointments. Yep. So I, if I can fill the sales schedule, everything else takes care of itself, baby. Like that, that's, that, that's, I know. And for forever, it was always like, you learn how to prospect at all these, some of these sales boot camps way back in the day. And what's the third number? The third number is going to be, I don't ever look at gross dollars, like total dollars sold or anything like that. Um, the third number is going to vary depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. Those first two numbers are probably going to point me in a direction I need to go and look at for, for that third number. And if it's a, if it's an opportunity issue that I'm having, then I'm going to go and look at my, my cost per lead, my cost per opportunity. I'm going to look at specific lead sources on where they're coming in, where like what my pay-per-click costs are, where my budgets have been. So if it's an opportunity problem, then I'm going to go and dig into why I have opportunity problems and all those analytics. If it's a gross margin problem, I'm going to start looking at in particular jobs. I'm going to go, I'm going to pull up the last month and every one that has a margin alert, like I'm going to get an alert. It'll be bright red for everything that didn't hit the, the margin. And that's real time information that I can, you know, I click, dig into that project, dig into the sub project, and I can look at the billings, exactly what was used, what was sold. I can look at the video the salesperson took there. I can listen to the phone call that the appointment setter had all in one spot. Wow. And, and so those two numbers, gross margin and opportunity count, are going to tell me what I need to drill into to figure out what's going on with my company. And we have dashboards set up for each one of our people. So each division has their own dashboard. So they know how many dollars each crew has installed, how many quality controls each one of the crews have installed, how many five-star reviews each one of the crews got. I know the percentage of financing each one of my sales people sold, the type of financing my sales people sold, the, uh, you, you name the analytic. You can figure it out. We, we, we track it. And, and here's the key. You don't play gotcha. Okay. If you're doing this to yell at your people or play gotcha, then you're not doing it the right way. Mm. If you're looking at these numbers and then coming up with a training program on how to get better at what you suck at, because it's it really comes down to me. Like people want to do good, Dimitri. It's just the way it is. Everyone as a whole I believe wants to do good. If you can show them where they suck or they're, where they're bad, they're going to appreciate you. And this is where show you get them. your loyalty. And then if you can show them that if they make these improvements, look at how much more money you can make. And you can design these compensation programs that really help people and affect people mm -hmm. and change people. That's, that's where guys like Rodney Webb, why people say he changed my life it's because he's affected their business, their personal life, their wallets, their their people, their retention rates. Sales managers don't leave companies that have been in Rodney a while. I have this no lie, 95% retention rate with my sales team. Like people don't have that typically around. I just speaking of equity groups, I talked to a equity group recently that was looking at contractor flow, and they had a seven hundred percent turnover rate on their salespeople. 700% turnover rate. Wow. Yeah. Who would want to buy that? Yeah, no. I, somebody cheap. <laughs> so, so down the road. But again, this is a, a fella taking over uh, a group that's been with an equity group. So this oh. is like, I think, a second run. Sure. So he's cleaning up a lot of mess, and uh, I wish him nothing but the best. But knowing what to measure and how to how to take those measurements into training. For me, that's 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 the key. Like, is it quality control? Is it people? Is it book training? Is it knowledge? Is it 
sales process? Is it the CRM? Sometimes the, all these computer systems we put in front of people, sometimes people aren't good at that. Mm. I, have a, I have a guy that was dyslexic for, that worked for me for two weeks before he told me he was dyslexic. We we're wondering why his diagrams, we can't get anything to work. Oh, well, he's a sales manager now. Like, it's again, people learn differently, but if you can find ways to, to figure things out and have conversations like that, again, you're not playing gotcha. Hmm. You're not saying like, hey, you suck. Look at this. How do you figure this out? We're like, see, why would you draw it this way? Or why did you, know, and, and you have those types of conversations. It leads to, I think, more of a collaboration, more of a, I don't know what I'm trying to, trying to say here. No, I but get it. It's, uh, it just, no, yeah, it's yeah. more fun to go to work. I can tell you that much when everyone knows that we're just finding a way to get better, not trying to point fingers at why we're, why we're bad. Love it. My next question is, who do you usually lose jobs to? Hmm. Like truly lose jobs. Dude. Outside of a storm. Mm -hmm. um, in the retail world, believe it or not, and I do focus groups. My favorite focus group that I like to do is the people that we gave estimates to that didn't buy from me. Mm -hmm. And almost always, the higher percentage of those people did nothing. So I lose or, more or jobs on the retail side of things to people choosing to do nothing than people to choosing a competitor. That's why I told you, competitors are not our enemy. Mm -hmm. Almost never. One, there are no secrets. Okay. You mm -hmm. think you have the secret sauce, you don't. Everyone knows pretty much everything and can try everything or learn about everything. There's not, I mean, yes, there are some things maybe you could, could do that others aren't going to do or give you an edge here or there, earn a buying agreement or a financing program or whatever the case may be. But for the most part, other contractors aren't why I've ever lost jobs. I've lost jobs because either the people didn't like us or my pricing was wrong or I didn't figure out a way to help them fix what they were, their main problem was. That's where I lose the majority of work. Now in a storm, there's people that are way better at putting 40 people in a neighborhood knocking on doors than I am. I don't do that. Do you do door knocking at all? No. Zero, okay. Zero. Now we will, um, I do some work with the, the drone people. Okay. And what we will do in a storm We'll, uh, we'll send drone teams to our past customers that I see. were affected in that storm and get them out there and get the reports in advance and try to get the process going before our, our salespeople are. I'm not waiting around for a storm. What's Chan you, what? Chances are a storm happens and you call me, it's going to be two weeks before I can send a salesman. Let me ask you this. I remember that back in the day, um, you you were always much higher than insurance proceeds and you never even did yeah. work with the, with the you, you don't want to even deal with insurance paperwork. No. So you just give them, you pretty much do retail. But, yeah. <laughs> Again, it's really, really important to me to make sure that I'm not dealing with the next person that sits in my chair isn't dealing with a roofing problem. And this is why I'm a big believer in the extended warranties and the enhanced warranties that manufacturers offer. Um, again, going to one of those round tables at the, the, the GAF event, the Master Elite, mm -hmm. I didn't do Golden Pledge ever. I'm like, I already do a lifetime workmanship guarantee. Why would I put, that seems like a waste of money. My exact words. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fellow looks at me and goes, well, you're an idiot. It's $12 a square. It's the cheapest insurance policy you can buy that can never tell you you installed it wrong because they check it off on it. I'm like, okay, well, that's a, apparently I was looking at it the wrong way because we got out of roofing at one point in time completely because our customers were having organic shingles curl and the granules go away and they're getting 500, $600 from the manufacturer to replace the roof. Well, my dad is going to let you do that. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to off. We're going to give you labor. We're going to help out wow. on that stuff. So it did. Yeah. So it got us out of roofing completely. And then, and I don't know, let's say 19, 2001 would have been the last, first time we were back in as a certified roofer with the JF. Wow. And it was because Josh Keeney, I was telling you about Arnita mm -hmm. guy. We went to my dad's office and asked him, what's the most you could, you think you could sell a roof at? And he gave us, I don't know, 300 square. And I left. 
I go, well, if we had $75 to that number, he can't get mad at us, mad at us if we sell a couple of roofs. Because we were walking away from roofs left and right. Sure. Because we were gutter sales guys. So then we started selling roofs and, you know, roofs are 65% you know, of our revenue uh, or 65% more revenue in roofing than there is gutters this year. So Love it. it's a, it's a, I, I have better luck with them than My most. Name. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, let, let's talk about safety. Um, Osha love, oh, loves, great question. Osha loves fines. Mm -hmm. They follow us taking pictures. What do you do for safety? And is it possible for us as a business owners to make people accountable to wear harness every single time. Because you, you can snap the picture, you know, in so many scenarios. Like even when you inspect the job, mm -hmm. like there's so many scenarios where it's impossible to it wear. It needs to be part of your culture. Okay. And we need to get better at that as well. And it's always something that we're talking about. In fact, I uh, yesterday I received, again, peers are the best resources. And if you know any companies that deal within like West Coast, Washington State, those areas, California, mm -hmm. Florida, their safety programs are usually a lot more robust than the Midwest yes. companies. So if you have friends that have to have that and are interacting with OSHA on a regular basis, don't be afraid to reach out. And again, it's always a two-way street. But mm -hmm. yesterday I received some of the craziest safety stuff from friends of mine. Canada has good ones too. Yeah. And I, uh, uh, we, we have, we have Canadian company on our, uh, on contractor flow, uh, I, I haven't even, that's a good idea. I'm going to follow up with them because we have a full-time safety director and getting people to wear harnesses is, you know, always, always a challenge in the roofing world and, and, and on safety as a whole, but we have to meet weekly and have these types of conversations all of the time, especially like when cold and hot, there's things that, that you have to worry about differently up here, I think, mm -hmm. than, 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 than in other spots. For me, I've wrote more corrective action notices for eyewear and hearing protection than any other thing in my company. Hmm. because I know how deaf I am. And it was from not wearing hearing protection as, as a young male. Like we, we have to understand you go into this, in, into this industry, our brains aren't developed until we're 25. It's like your fear center doesn't tell you what to do the right thing all the time as a, as a young male. It just, it just, it just doesn't. So I try to have these conversations with all new hires. I've taken my safety director aside and I told him that. And I asked him, I go, oh, I want to talk to anybody over 40 that's been in this industry and see if their hearing is as good as it could be. And almost always they talk about how their hearing is worse than their wives or worse than somebody not in the industry. Sure. And it, so you start to understand that. And if you really do care about your people, you gotta, you gotta take those steps and We've been inspected by OSHA. I've been fined by OSHA, Ed, but we have a full-time safety director and was able to prove like, this is what we're doing and how we're doing it and where we're setting it up. If you have a plan and you're putting the effort there. It's half, that, that's, half the problem solved. It, half the problem solved. And maybe don't look at OSHA as like the the, the big bad you know, werewolf in the, in the conversation because you can call them and talk to them and I, get help from them. I, we cover news now, weekly news. We just I just recorded an episode yesterday. It airs this Sunday. There's a contractor out of Chicago or Wisconsin, I think, maybe Madison. I remember, but he has uh, two fines in one month. A couple of years ago, he has six fines. So it's like such a repeated, a repeated case. And now he's facing two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars in fines. How do you have like ten fines in like? Want to use it because because of the repetition, you can tell there's a pattern. The guy just does not care. You know how do you get two fines in one month? Uh, you know it's there's story. No system in place. Again, exactly. not caring. Exactly, not caring. It's got to be got to be there. You know what's worse than a two hundred seventy thousand dollar fine? Having somebody get severely hurt. Yep. You know um, that that, that I I I I'd, 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 I'll take. The money over, over having that conversation any day of the week, and from a guy, again, as a young male, I set up scaffolding some really stupid ways. Have, like I did some things to finish jobs that I shouldn't have as a young male, and then they're probably right. lucky I'm here. Have you ever have someone hurt on the job site? Yeah, yeah, no, we we what's, what got a couple of guys case? on uh, on light duty now coming back uh, from, from 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 falls, um, cuts. We get a lot of cuts. Um, had a salesperson, you know, uh, been injured. I've, I've, uh, luckily, you know, I've fallen off a few roofs. I have third degree burns from my knee 
down uh, just above my ankle. I was measuring a roof with shorts on, and I slid all the way down the roof Ooh. and took all like a quarter inch of flesh, like my skin, and like it was that, that deep by about that. So I uh, for they almost talked about having to do skin grafts. Wow. So I uh, uh, if I had to change that dressing and to, still to this day, if I wear shorts, that part of my body gets sunburnt marketably faster than any anywhere. It's the only place I actually get sunburnt. Wow. So it, uh, it, you know, that kind of stuff happens. So it's, and it's our industry. And if we don't talk about it, it can't get better. If we don't measure it, it can't get better. Now, fall protection, I think has come a long ways the last few years. The harnesses are easier. Hard hats are easier. Everything is a lot more comfortable to wear. But, you know, it's just something that needs to be part of your culture. I agree. And, uh, yeah. You learn a lot. You implement a lot. Can you name three, four tools or products you implemented in 2023 or maybe last few years? You know, um, for us, uh, we're looking at, hmm, millboard decking. Probably my favorite new product I've 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 been able to introduce over the last couple of years. Out of all the composite deckings I've seen, mm -hmm. this millboard decking is the most stable. So at my house right now, I have four different types of decking. I have Azek, I have Zuri, I have a, a wood deck, and I have millboard. How, how many decks do you have? Three. <laughs> okay. So my the front entryway of my house is a little bit of deck. I have a little deck in in uh, the back of my house. And then off my porch, I built a, again, it's like a 12 foot by eight foot deck where I have an outdoor kitchen. Mm. And I, I, I have the, again, I live in an old, old home, <laughs> old four square in, in, uh, in Western Wisconsin. But so the one deck in the back of the house, it's fine. I just want to see how long it's going to last. My Zuri deck, we, we leave the house since I, I love you. Don't die in the deck when it's frosty out. Because that thing is so darn slippery. But the millboard deck, I haven't seen any expansion and contraction. It looks like wood. It's as it has as much traction as any decking I've ever seen. So, and now we've been installing it for three years in in the Twin Cities market, and we're seeing more and more people choose mm. choose that product. Like it's our lead decking now. Um, uh, new products. That's probably really in the last couple of years. Really, what about the only one. What software or for, digital products? You mentioned drones you're using, you know, new technology the, maybe? I have a, a mixed bag with the Loveland drone stuff. Like, I don't know how much it actually helps us acquire jobs or win arguments with insurance companies. One, I'm not in a lot of arguments with insurance companies to begin with, so I'm maybe not the best person to measure that. But it did cut down on cancellation rates. Like, for us, an analytic we look at, because we're always so far out, is the amount of people that cancel our, our estimates before we even get there. So having the drones go out there, cut that rate down substantially. And it gave you a, a, the, the, the tool. Our internal numbers and things that we're looking at have been more of a change for, for us. Um, for me, when I look at how, like, things that we've done to get more competitive, our, our healthcare system, mm. okay? Our, the coolest thing that we've done is brought healthcare to back to be in-house at Linus Instruction. We are a self-funded healthcare plan. Oh. And we did that February of 2020. Ladies, literally last words to my brothers and I as we're in this meeting was, outside of a worldwide pandemic, you guys are pretty well covered. But if you have to hit the 50, like every way you do this, is like there's an X amount of dollars that every employee would hit before another plan kicks in. Mm -hmm. So if every employee hits the max, we're basically bankrupt this first year because we don't have, you don't have the money in there, but we're getting to a point where like, we're going to be, hey, nobody pays any healthcare premiums next month or for the rest of the year, your healthcare premiums for everyone here are reduced by 50%. If you don't like those types of wow, things, like cool. when you're looking at like what you can do for employees, that kind of stuff goes a long ways. And I've made a lot of people come onto our, onto our healthcare system by making those changes. A lot of people chose to, to have their spouse be on their spouse's healthcare program before. And I always looked at them like, why are we even offering healthcare? No one chooses us. Is our healthcare that crappy? Our dentist up that crappy? Our vision that crappy? No one chooses ours. They're always using their spouses. 
And so we we looked hard and we finally got into a solution there that 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 is really working. Our 401k plan. We uh 2 years ago started auto enrolling everyone. And wow. and and just making sure so and then we auto enroll we escalate it every every year until you hit the max of of getting so for us. So if you put in 6%, we're going to we're going to match up to 6%. So if you're putting in 6%, we're going to give you a company match of 3%. So you're going to 50% return on your money on your first 6% that you're putting in there and that's the way it's the way it's always been. In fact, actually, now we went to 7 and 3 and a half. So we're going to escalate it and automatically have that happen until you're there. And almost nobody under like realizes that money gone, it didn't make a difference in that 1%. But now I have people that I work for some 25, 30 35 years and you're seeing that kind of stuff. So now you're having success stories. Like mm-hmm. you're not going to be living on social security or you have the ability. I, people asking to take loans out against their 401k stuff on a regular basis from an employee standpoint. I don't remember that happening a decade ago. Just think having those types of things in place and options that they can choose are, are important long-term and, and uh, short-term disability. Like we, both of those are, are, are real things at, at Linux instruction. Uh, figuring out Minnesota's PTO laws very quickly hmm. is uh, something that we spent a lot of time on, and I think our solutions behind it were were innovative. And so um, I told you about like our big problem: we hire mm-hmm. fifty three people. Yep. Imagine you hire fifty three people and give them eighty hours of PTO right out the gate. Wow. Like here's two weeks of PTO. That's kind of like the one of the plans the state of Minnesota has is to do that, or yep. you can accrue. Yeah, we just or, got a couple of months ago. I think. Was yeah. Fun. Yeah, so we're, you know, anybody that's been with us longer than a year automatically has, you know, 80 hours of PTO anyway, so we're, we're covered there. Sure. But now we're, you know, for every hour worked in Minnesota, or it used to be, it was by towns at one point. Now it's the entire state. And the, I think you for every hour, 40 hours worked, you earned an hour of PTO. So your first year, we figured out how to accrue those we're, things. But We have to wrap it up. I have two last questions. Number one is give advice to family businesses, specifically to father-son relationships. We, I know a lot of guys working with their dads inherit their companies. You work with your dad, you have your sons. Mm-hmm. What advice would you give to the business owner who has a son or maybe works with the dad, like that dynamic uh, relationship business? Oh, that's a, that's a really good one. You know, I worked with my mother a lot more than my father. See. My brother Adam worked with my father a lot more than 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 our mother. Like my mom was sales and marketing. My dad was more of the production side of things. Now my mom ran sales and marketing. My dad did most of our sales still. So as I've gotten older, I seem like I'm I'm I I go to them for different things. But stay involved. I think listening is as important as as anything. And I've never been the best listener in the room. I've always been something I've, I've been trying to work on. But don't fathers need to not discount how smart their kids are, mm. and the kids need to do the same about these old people that may not know anything because they have they have the experience. When I see people butting heads and having these succession plans, and 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 not doing things and selfishness, usually when these are going sideways, call a spade a spade. Someone's being selfish. Something's going on there. The, either the kid wants too much from the company that the company can't give up, or I've seen it where the, the kid has taken the company to the next step and parents have seen this and they try to, I've never, you'd never describe my mom and dad as selfish or I like if some, like to me, then there's a fighting words. Like selfish is, is, is the worst word somebody can call you. And, and if you, if, if you're a selfish person there, your chances of success as a second generation person are, are very small. And if you're not looking and if there's not an exact plan, like this is what we're going to do. And here's the compensation plan. This is how you're going to buy me out. And this is how I got to walk off into the sunset. You have to understand that too. I was lucky. Mom and dad started 11 other companies that allowed them to walk off into the sunset. Mm. If, I didn't, Powerful. I didn't have to spend like there's a, a note on my balance sheet that is unpaid for the purchase of Linus construction to my parents. Like it's a one and a half million dollar note 
Wow. Uh, that's on my balance sheet. And someday, you know, I keep asking him to pay it. He's always in some tax problem. Like he's, he's a renter. He, he's, he's, you know, it's his birthday today, by the way. Oh, wow. So 72. Um, and he has rent coming in all the places. And I don't know if he's just full of shit or what that doesn't want us to pay him. But we was like, hey, do you want us to pay some of this? Like, no, no, bad tax year. Oh, it's a bad tax year. And it's never a bad tax year. Yeah, a guy doesn't have any income. Like, I, I, the mom and dad just don't, they don't need. We're not flashy people. You don't see us driving crazy cars. You don't see us doing that, but you do see us, you know, celebrating our family and our people. And we spend a lot of time together and we travel and we, we do those types of things. Um, but it's a, uh, Love it. That's the best way. Uh, how, every every family is different, but communication is key. I've seen family relationships get destroyed from businesses, but when the communication gets opened back up, it can be like a decade gone. That can be mended. It really can. And I can tell you this. I've never, ever talked to anyone in my life that regretted mending that relationship. And you understand that. Mm -hmm. You put that on Facebook yesterday, and I'm like, Here's, you are as impressive as an individual. You know yourself, you're trying to get better. You're looking to mend relationships. You're like only people that are really comfortable with themselves and what they're doing and really care about people. Try to do that, Dimitri. You're setting an example for everyone. You. you really I, are. I, I have three people. I, I restore three relationships. Well, hey. That's it. Out of all like people I knew, it was very cool. All right, we got to go. Last was GAF one of them? Uh, if they call me, if they text me, there's no one to call. Like I, I'll, I, I'll call. I, I'll call. I had. I like. I'm. I'm like. I know. Like. I probably have to do a preemptive strike with the GAF folks. Like, hey, I'm Bon Dimitri's podcast. But I, I would. Love he to he talk likes to you guys. People. Mike Goldstein was a GAF guy. He's one of your. He's one of your biggest he, advocates. And people. and but partnerships and family are the most important in in, in business. And if you treat your partnerships like family, and your family like a partnership. It's, I think all good things that happen. What I mean is there needs to be a reason and numbers that back up what, why people are successful. It can't be because I've always done it this way. That can't be a reason. Hmm. It can't be because you're family. There has to be more to it than that. And if you really try and be collaborative, like I don't, I haven't come up with any of almost any of the analytics that I look at or numbers that I look at or anything that I'm, that I'm doing. It's the team. The family as a collaborative. If you're button heads with your mom or dad or vice versa, or your kid, chances are someone's not being as open and honest about what's going on. Okay. Last advice to the homeowner who is looking to hire a contract. Take notes um, and really read your contract and compare apples mm -hmm. to apples uh, and, and take the time on the front end. Never make an emotional decision. Like if you can take the time on the front end where I, where I see problems, and I, and I don't want to knock on the door knockers at all because there's there's a part of me. When I say, I, I come from a family of laborers. We were the labor on jobs. We, we came from being the sub. You can't to maybe sometimes take that next step without knocking on a few doors. But when I run into a customer that had an issue with the contractor, chances are they hired a door knocker. And chances are, but like the bigger chances, they didn't do anything on the front end. They didn't check out the references. They didn't look at a job. They didn't know the exact color or single manufacturer they're getting. There's like there's some of the contracts that people sign. It, there's no details. It's, there's nothing. And I think out of like the 20 some odd companies or whatever we put on, on contractor pool, like three of them had legal contracts. Like we look at these this, this stuff wow. and like half their contracts aren't even legal. How they get licensed is is beyond me. And if you want to want to improve something across this entire industry, make licensing harder, or make the licensing classes better. Especially like maybe not in Minnesota, but some states. Some states. It's Texas. A, <laughs> Wisconsin. 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 Like like half the time you don't need to pull a permit to do a roof. Hmm. It's by municipality in in a lot of spots. It's. Yeah, it's uh, Iowa. We're like, we don't have to go to Texas to find easier spots to do work than Minnesota, but but look at the quality we get in Minnesota. There's a reason why our labor is more expensive here. 
You don't hear roofers paying labor 65 bucks a square in Minnesota anymore. Mm -hmm. You do everywhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's something to be said about stricter. I wish, you know, you don't say a lot about laws, but I wish more states were as strict as Minnesota and Florida were to, to do business. Now, I agree. Yeah, it's just, I think it makes it all better. It shouldn't be easy. All right, it's a wrap. Guys, comment below, give it a like for Andy. Thank you so much for doing it, brother. Thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you.